Um, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. I want to preach to you this morning a comforting passage. A comforting passage. I think this is the first time also as well that I've ever had slides. Um, thanks to my lovely wife for putting that together. Um, seeing dad having slides on a Sunday morning. She said, Jeremy, you have to have slides. I said, all right, fine. We'll have slides. Uh, so we'll see how they go um, this morning. But I want to preach to you, as I said, a comforting message um, entitled, The Lord will give you strength. The Lord will give you strength. Our text this morning is Isaiah chapter 40, verses 27 to 31, and it reads, Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God? Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not? Neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Let's pray this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to thank you for this time that we have together. Lord, I want to thank you for the song service that we just had, Lord, and the praise and adoration that we sang to your holy name. Lord, I pray that you'll just be with us now as we look to your word this morning. I pray that you would uh, calm my nerves, Lord, that you would hide me behind your cross. Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit would be filled in this place. And Lord, that your Holy Spirit will be filled in every church and every pulpit around the world that is uh, proclaiming your word. Lord, we ask that you would be with us this morning. We love you and we thank you for all that you do in Jesus' name. Amen. There is a famous story about the uh, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill was the British Prime Minister during the time of World War II and those of you that have studied World War II history, I was a bit of a history nerd when I was in high school. I loved all the world wars. And you would study about this man, Winston Churchill, and his great victory that he brought for Britain in World War II. World War II saw the, saw the country of Britain on the, on the cusp of defeat against Nazi Germany. But Winston Churchill, the, the prime minister at the time, rose up, rallied the troops, put in these strategies. and ultimately took the nation of Britain from utter defeat to victory. That same year after World War II ended was the, the national election, and uh, Prime Minister uh, Winston Churchill was running to be re-elected. And as the story goes, that despite his efforts in World War II, he was not re-elected as Prime Minister for his next term. And it is recorded a conversation between him and his wife, Clementine Churchill, and she looked at her husband, who was no doubt probably gutted, uh, having defeated, uh, been defeated in this election, and she looks at her husband to console him and says that the affair or the election was just a blessing in disguise. Winston Churchill then, it's recorded, had responded to his wife and said, if it be so, then the blessing is very well in disguise. Have you ever felt like this in your life? Have you ever felt like when you're going through a trial, when you're going through a problem in your life, that you look up to God and you're saying, Lord, where are you? Where is this blessing that I'm supposed to get out of this? This is where the children of Israel find themselves in Isaiah chapter 40. The closing verses of Isaiah 40 offer great comfort for those inevitable difficult times. As we go through life, it is inevitable that you and I are going to go through periods of time where we are going to feel like that the Lord is not with us. We are going to feel like, uh, Lord, where is this blessing that we're supposed to receive from this trial? But Isaiah says that we can find comfort knowing that the Lord will give you strength. See, Isaiah 40 is a turning point in, the, in Isaiah's prophecy. The prophecy of Isaiah is split into, into two sections, chapters 1 through chapters 39. It warns of the appending judgment that is to come on God's rebellious people. But by the time we get to chapter 40, there is a shift in his writing. We are, we are welcomed with a new section and we assume that at this point in time, Israel has been defeated. Its armies have been 
overtaken and the city has ultimately been captured. But now Isaiah says to the people of God a new message and it says in verses 1 and 2, it says, Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Speak ye comfortably to Jerusalem and cry unto her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned, pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. Here in Isaiah chapter 40, the prophet begins to extend comfort to the weary and troubled people of God. He extends comfort by promising future deliverance by the mighty hand of their God. As you read, there are allusions to the ultimate deliverance that is to come through the arrival of the Messiah King. This is what Isaiah was promising to the people. He said, hey, your future deliverance is, is the Lord Jesus Christ. But when you get to the end of Isaiah chapter 40, it says this, that there is still a dilemma. What are these weak and troubled and weary people meant to do in the meantime? Isaiah says, hey, deliverance is coming. Jesus, the Messiah King, is coming. But the people of Israel are thinking, yes, that's all well and good, but what are we meant to do in the meantime? Jesus is coming, but there is a long way between the book of Isaiah to the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. What are these weak and weary people meant to do for now? And Isaiah gives them what they are meant to do in these closing verses of Isaiah chapter 40. The message of the passage that we read this morning is simply this. The Lord will give you strength. The Lord will give you strength if you trust him in your time of weakness. These words of the end of Isaiah chapter 40 were written by the prophet to offer comfort to the people of Israel as they waited for their Messiah to come. But you and I can also be comforted by this verse as we wait for the Messiah to come again. The Lord will give you strength. The days and the times in which we live in are trouble. And no doubt as we look at the difficult circumstances around us, we are to question, Lord, how can I receive this blessing? What good can possibly come out of this problem? As we follow Jesus, as we serve him in ministry, we are going to be faced with dangers. We're going to be faced with toils. We're going to be faced with snares. See, some preachers will tell you that if you put your faith and trust in Jesus, your life is going to be easy. But we know by reading God's word that this is not the case. Jesus says that he will give you strength if you trust in him in your time of weakness. Someone said that one who follows Christ ought to have ambidextrous faith. He says you ought to have ambidextrous faith that on the one hand that you can accept troubles, you can accept toils, you can accept snares, but on the other hand you can catch the blessing and he says you put them together and as it says in Romans chapter 8 verse 28, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. The Lord will give you strength if you trust him in your time of weakness. And if you're taking notes this morning, I want to see three conditions that we must face if we are going to receive strength from the Lord. The first point this morning, it'd help if I turn this on, that God will give you strength to those who worship him. If, if you are going to receive strength from the Lord in your time of trouble, the prophet Isaiah says that God will give you strength if you first worship him. Verse 27 of Isaiah 40 begins to register the complaints of the children of Israel. It says, Why sayest thou, O Jacob, and speakest, O Israel, my way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God? Notice the, the graphic language which their complaint is registered here. It is the nation of Israel feeling that, that God is hiding from them. They feel that God has disregarded them. It is it is not just something that they are feeling and keeping to themselves. They are, they are actively speaking it out. Lord, why are you hiding from us, Lord? Why have you disregarded us? 
Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt that maybe God was playing hide and go seek just as you needed him the most in a certain situation? Have you ever felt that God has disregarded your desperate pleas for help? This is how the children of Israel felt in this passage. Interestingly enough, Isaiah acknowledges how they feel without affirming how they feel. He recognizes, but then he rebukes their complaint. He says, why do you talk like this, Jacob and Israel? Why are you saying that, that God is hiding from you? Why is it that you say that the Lord has disregarded you? It says in verse 28, hast thou not known? Hast thou not heard? That the everlasting God, the Lord of the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. In verse 28, it is clear now that the prophet's tone is argumentative. And you see that in the word not. You see, he doesn't say, uh, Israel, do you know this about the Lord? Or Israel, have you, have you heard this? about your God. No, he says, Israel, do you not know? Israel, have you not heard? Going forward here from verse 28, Isaiah is going to, to point them to the divine perfections to which they should trust. He's going to spell out for them reasons as to why they should trust and worship their God. But before he does so, it is as if Isaiah is saying to the people of God, hey, before I tell you what I'm about to tell you, let me first tell you what I'm about to tell you is no new news. He's reminding the children of Israel, hey, Israel, what I'm going to tell you, it's not something new. It's not, hey, have you heard this? It's Israel, how have you not heard this? Israel, have you, have you not known? You should already know this, that, that the Lord is everlasting. The Lord is the creator of the ends of the earth. These things, Isaiah points out, are things that Israel should have already known about God, and no doubt it is things that you and I should already know about Him as well. These things about God are not new to us. They were not new to the people of Israel. Isaiah was not trying to impart a new revelation onto this people, but rather he was trying to recall to their memory the things that they should already know. He reminds the children of Israel, hey, God is not hiding from you. Uh, God has, has not disregarded you. But simply you are looking in the wrong direction. Israel was so focused about looking what was around them rather than just simply looking up and seeing God for who he was. Isaiah first reminds the children of Israel that if they're going to worship him, they need to remember that God is the everlasting God. God is the everlasting God. God is not bound by calendars. He is not bound by watches. He is not bound by daily schedules. God lives in one eternal now. Psalm 90 verse 2 says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. In eternity past, God was God all by himself. And when this hiccup of eternity called time has come into play, and, and once that has all been finished, God will still be God alone, all by himself. He is from everlasting to everlasting. This theological truth is to point out a practical application that God's timing is perfect. Because he is the everlasting God. The words too early and, and too late do not appear in, in God's dictionary. However, when, when God moves, when God acts on your request, it is always the right time. God is the everlasting God. His timing is perfect. Think of the story of Noah. How long was it before God showed up with the rain and the flood? But when God sent the rain and the flood, it was the perfect time. 
Think of the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, no doubt the, 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 these boys would have thought, Lord, all right, we're about to walk in now. Where are you? But God waited till those three boys were in the midst of the fire before he showed up. But hey, it was still the perfect timing. I'm reminded of the story of Mary and Martha and their brother Lazarus. The poor man had been dead for four days, still no sign of Jesus. Jesus shows up four days later and they said, Lord, he's stinking. But see, even though Jesus was four days after he died, the Bible says that God's timing was perfect. You cannot hurry God. You just have to wait, trust him, and give him time no matter how long it takes. God is a God who we cannot hurry, but he will be there. He, he, he may not show up when you think he ought to show up. He may not answer in the, in the time frame that you need an answer. But hey, let me remind you, church, that when God shows up and when God answers your request, it is the perfect time. If you are going to worship the Lord, we must remember that God is eternal. He is the everlasting God. Not only was Isaiah reminding the people that God was eternal, but Isaiah also describes and declares here in verse 28 that the Lord is sovereign. He says God is eternal and God is sovereign. It says the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth. Genesis 1.1 says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. If you truly believe the very first verse of the Bible, you shouldn't have a problem believing every other verse that follows. The first verse of the, of the Bible that we hold in our hands is vital because it is a true statement of history. And not only is it a statement about the creation of the origin of the world, but it is also a statement about our God. The scripture declares that God as the one, is the one and only creator. There is a theological assumption that the one who creates the thing is greater than the thing he creates and reigns over it. And when the scriptures declare God as a creator of the ends of the earth, it is saying that God reigns over, over every end of the world. There, there is not a corner of the earth that you can go to to which God does not have rule over. There is no way you can hide from God in which he is not sovereign over that part of the earth. In fact, note the poetry. He doesn't just say that God created the earth. He says that God created the ends of the earth. Chart the universe. Every place you measure is the handiwork of a sovereign God. To say that God is eternal means you can trust him at all times. To say that God is the creator of the earth is to say that you can trust him in all places. Wherever you find yourself, whatever time you find yourself in, God is in charge there. He is the creator of the ends of the earth. Then continuing in verse 28, furthermore, not only is God eternal and God is sovereign, Isaiah points out and reminds the children of Israel, hey, if you're going to worship the Lord, remember that God is omnipotent. He has all power over the created world and he affirms God's omnipotence by saying what, what God cannot do. He says, he fainteth not, neither is weary. Praise God for what God does not do. You, you may have people in your life that you believe you can count on in times of trouble. You may have people in your life for which you can bring a problem to, ask them to pray for you, ask them to, to fast for you. You might even ask for financial help. But you see, we're all humans, and as we keep going, we are going to grow weary, and we will faint. But church, let me remind you, when you bring your problems to the Lord, He is someone who does not get weary. He is someone who fainteth not. Then not only is God eternal, not only is He sovereign, not only is he all-powerful, he never wearies, he never fainteth. But, God, but, is, but Isaiah sorry, continues to declare that God was all-wise. It says at the end of verse 28, there is no searching of his understanding. 
If we are going to worship the Lord this morning, church, if we are going to uh, have that strength that the God promises, we need, to, we need to worship Him. Worship Him because He is eternal. Worship Him because He is sovereign. Worship Him because He is all-powerful. And worship Him because He is wise. Not only is God able, but God always knows what he is doing. Psalm 145 verse 3 says, Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Our God is all wise. There is no searching of his understanding. Even when life is chaotic to us, and even when we have no idea what is going on, even when we have no idea what it is that God is actually trying to do, God knows what he's doing. Here in this 28th verse of Isaiah chapter 40, it says God will give you strength. But you have to stop looking around and being consumed by your circumstances and your troubles. Stop looking left to right, but rather look up. Look up to your heavenly father and remember who he is. Isaiah says that God will give you strength to those who worship him. Secondly, this morning, he says that God gives strength to those who acknowledge their weakness. God will give you strength if you acknowledge your weakness. It says in verse 29 of Isaiah chapter 40, he giveth power to the faint and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. God is not stingy with his strength. He is, he's willing to share every aspect of it. But there is a condition. He gives power to the faint and to them that have no might, he increases strength. Isaiah proclaims that God gives power to the faint and to the ones who have no might to do anything in and of themselves whatsoever. God increases strength, but the moment we reach an attitude of self-deficiency, we'll auto, self sorry, will automatically disqualify you from God's divine enablement. You see, if you and I get to the point where we think we can do it on our own, we will not receive the strength from God. To receive the strength, you must first acknowledge that we are weak. To receive salvation, you must first acknowledge that you are lost. To receive forgiveness from someone, you must first acknowledge and confess your sin. To experience how great God is, you must first acknowledge how weak you and I are. Everyone knows the great Muhammad Ali. And there was a famous story that as he was heading to one of his fights, or maybe he was returning home from a fight, that he hopped on the plane. And those of you who have traveled, you know there is that that period of time where you, you, you find your seat, you put your overhead luggage, you, you're meant to put your seatbelt on and, and sit down. I usually start watching movies before we even take off. But the story goes that as the flight attendants were, were doing their final checks before they started to, to taxi, they came across Muhammad Ali's seat and the lady asked Muhammad Ali, sir, can you please buckle your seatbelt? And uh, Muhammad Ali and this flight attendant had gone back and forth and, as to why he shouldn't have to put his seatbelt on. And the story goes that Muhammad Ali uh, looked at this lady and said, Ma'am, do you know who I am? He said, I'm Superman. Now leave. The lady looked at him and smiled and said, Yeah, you might not be Superman, but Superman doesn't need to play neither. Now sit down and buckle your seat. I hate to be the one to break it to you this morning, my friends, but you and I are not as strong as we think we are. All it takes is one phone call. All it takes is, all it takes, sorry, is one letter in the mail. All it takes is one meeting in your boss's office. All it takes is one trip to the doctor's office. All it takes is one split second on the road and you and I will find out how true and weak we are. C.S. Lewis once said that the one who has God and other things really has nothing more than the one who only has God alone. 
identity. We might have money this morning, church. You might have education. You might have skill. You might have experience and ability. But you will inevitably face a time in your life where money cannot buy you out of it. You will face a time in your life where your education will not let you think, you, will not let you think it through. There will come a time in your life where your skill cannot pull you out of it. But church, don't be discouraged. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ who reigns over in heaven and earth, he is everything you need in your time of weakness. Be warned by the life of Uzziah. His story is found in the book of 2 Chronicles and, and, and in chapter 26. You read that this man Uzziah took over the throne of Judah at just the age of 16. And as you read through his life, you'll study that he reigned over, this, over these people for 52 years. His initial success turned into a great failure. His story goes that Uzziah, it says in 2 Chronicles 26, was marvelously helped by God. But his story goes that he was marvelously helped by God until he thought that he could do it on his own strength. He thought that his authority as king gave him the right to usurp the ministry of the priest. And as he tried to intrude on the altar and its proceeding, the Lord struck him with leprosy there and then. And you will read about his life, how he died a lonely man in a house all by himself. Another story I'm reminded of in turn there is Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4 about the great king Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel chapter 4 verse 28. And it says, all this came upon the king of Nebuchadnezzar. At the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of, of the kingdom? By the might of whose power? Of my own power. And for the honor of my majesty. Don't get me wrong, King Nebuchadnezzar had every right to think this. At the time, he was the greatest king to be on the planet of the earth. And I imagine one day as he's maybe walking along the, uh, the walls of his city, looking out over the vast cities that he had command over, looking at his armies maybe training in the fields, thinking, I've made it. All this that I have done by my own power, I have done it by my own hand. But watch what it says in verse 31 of Daniel chapter 4. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, that shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men, and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagle's feathers and his nails like bird's claw. Imagine one of the, the greatest men to walk on the planet of the earth. I, I imagine he would have been wearing that rich purple color, maybe a red cape, a, a solid gold crown on his head with, with countless jewels that were worth maybe millions of dollars. And the Bible says that as the words were in his mouth, as, as, as Nebuchadnezzar was saying, I have done this with my great power, the Lord humbled him. He went from being the, the greatest person to walk the planet in an instant to like a cow in the field. He went from standing tall to maybe having a hunchback walking on all fours. He went from having skin to having, it says, as feathers like an eagle that were wet like the dew. He went from being the greatest man to a cow. I'm assuming it was a cow. But you get the idea. He went from being the greatest person to a beast of the field. These stories affirm for us the power of weakness. As long as these great men had recognized their weakness, God would have kept them. See, God allowed for King Nebuchadnezzar to reach where he was. God allowed King Nebuchadnezzar to be the greatest person that ever walked the face of the planet. 
And it says in the final verses of Daniel chapter 4, it says, And at the end of days I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High. And I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. And then look with me in verse 37 of Daniel chapter 4. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor who? It wasn't himself. But he says that he praise and honor the king of heaven. All those, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment and those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. It was only then that God restored King Nebuchadnezzar. King Nebuchadnezzar went from saying, hey, it was all about me, it's all about my power. In an instant, God humbled him and that forced him to then say, hey, it's nothing about me, but it's all about God. Don't fall in love with yourself, church. Don't fall in love with your accomplishments just as King Uzziah and King Nebuchadnezzar did. Humble yourself. For it is better to be humble than to be humbled. Humble yourself like Paul who recognized the power of weakness. And it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distress for Christ's sake. And watch this. For when I am weak, then am I strong. God gives strength to those who remember to worship him. God gives strength to those who acknowledge their weakness to him. And thirdly and lastly this morning, church, God gives strength to those who determine to wait on him. Do you ever feel that during a particular trial or circumstance, we are, we're always in a hurry to get out of it? We are always in a hurry to, to find a solution. We're always in a hurry to maybe get the funds to pay off a, a certain loan. Do you ever feel that whilst we are in a hurry, that God is not? If you live like this, your life will no doubt be filled with worry, doubt, and fear. It is as simple as you and I being in a hurry and God is taking his perfect time. God will give you strength, but you must determine to wait on him. It says in verse 31, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Psalm 27 verse 14 says, Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Galatians chapter 6 verse 9 reads, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap, if we faint not. God will give you strength this morning, church, if you wait on him. God will give you a, renew, a renewed strength. Verse 31, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. That is to say that if you trust God in your time of weakness, whatever it may be, if you bring it to God, you can trade your weakness for his strength. The alternative to this is seen in verse 30 where it says, Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. You and I represent all those that are filled with life and energy and strength. But those three things will inevitably be faint and weary. It says, Even the youths and even the young men shall faint and be weary. It doesn't matter if you've been training if you're like a soldier preparing for the battlefield or if you're like an athlete preparing for the race if you do it all in your own strength it says that you will be weary and you will utterly fall isaiah is saying that you cannot put your trust in man because if you put your trust in man they will fall and they will be weary but he says if you put your trust in god he will renew your strength wait on the lord how ought we to wait on the Lord? I see that we need to wait on the Lord patiently. Psalm 37 verse 7 says, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. It's like a 
farmer waiting for his crops to grow. I know nothing about farming other than watching a documentary on uh, the Discovery Channel, but I assume they would one day they're out there turning over the soil, preparing the neat lines to plant the seeds. The next day they might be there throwing the seeds into the dirt. But I doubt that the very next morning they'll have six foot corn crops there. No, it takes days, it might take months, it might even take years for those crops to grow ready for the farmer to, to, to harvest them and to sell them. The same is when we wait on the Lord. The, palm, the farmer, sorry, has to wait patiently for his crops. So we too should wait patiently on God. God is not always going to give you an answer straight away. God is not always going to show up when you think it is the right time for him to show up. You need to wait patiently. Someone said, just let go and let God. We need to wait on the Lord patiently. We need to wait on the Lord quietly. It says in Lamentations 3.26, It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Take time away from the busyness of your schedule. Take time away from family. Take time away from friends. Do whatever it takes to spend a quiet time with the Lord. While you're waiting on the Lord, take time to step back and wait on Him. And then wait on the Lord continually. We need to wait patiently. We need to wait quietly. And we need to wait continually. It says in Hosea chapter 12, verse 6, Therefore turn thou to thy God, keep mercy and judgment, and wait on thy God continually. It is not a, 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 a once-in-a-lifetime transaction. It's not a one-and-done transaction. But rather it is a choice that we need to make every single day to wait on the Lord. We need to wait on the Lord continually. We need to wait on the Lord quietly. We need to wait on the Lord patiently. And Isaiah says, hey, if you do these things, watch the end of verse 31, it says, they shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. These three snapshots come together to make one point. God will give you strength when it's needed. The promise is not that you will feel strong. In fact, it is better. You don't need to, to feel strong because the stronger you feel, the more you are to be prone to be self-sufficient. But the weaker you feel, the more you will lean on God. If you are faced with a sudden crisis, if you trust in the Lord, it says He will renew your strength. He will renew your strength so that you can mount up as wings on eagles and rise over that problem. Maybe you are faced with an extended sickness, an extended trial or problem. Isaiah says, if you wait on the Lord, He will renew your strength. He will teach you to run a marathon as an athlete would so that you can run and not be weary to endure the trial. Or maybe it is in the daily the, the, the daily affairs of this life as you, as you walk through life and its challenges. Isaiah says that if you trust in the Lord, He will renew your strength so that you can continue to walk and not faint. I've often quoted Isaiah chapter 40 verse 31 in, in numerous messages or Bible studies that I've preached, but and it's probably one, my second favorite verse in all of the Bible. And while studying this passage the other night, I came across an interesting thought that I read in a commentary. Isaiah uses a literary device that illustrates progress through descent. See, Isaiah doesn't say you will first walk, then you will run, and then you will mount up and fly. But he says it's the opposite. He describes progress through descent. And the key is that the goal is at the end and not the beginning. See, when you and I begin to, to walk, well, begin to trust God, God does not want your faith journey or your ministry to be purely Him rising you above on eagle's wings each and every time. 
But no, God is going to, in the beginning part, he will, he will rise you up so you can get over that problem. But then it's as you're flying, he will then teach you how to run. And then he will slow you down so that you can walk through life with him. See, it wasn't all about being on an eagle's wings and flying as high as you can. But the point was that you and I could get to a stage where we could walk through a trial knowing that God is right by our side. I'm reminded of a story of a father and a daughter. They would often go for walks around their town. They, they knew every house. They, they knew all the people that would see on the street. One day, the father decided that he would just walk a little bit further into a new town with unfamiliar houses, unfamiliar streets, and unfamiliar people. And he looks to his daughter and he says, do you know where you are? She goes, no. He's like, would you know how to get home? She says, no, I wouldn't have a clue. He then says, are you scared? She's like, no. And the father, a little bit confused, thinking, my daughter's in a place where she doesn't know. My daughter is in a place where she doesn't know how to get home, but she's not scared. And the father looks at her again and says, daughter, are you sure you're not scared? And she looks back at him and smiles and said, dad, why would I be scared for? I'm with you. Same true, the same is true in our Christian walk. Church, God is going to take you to an unfamiliar town. God is going to take you to a place with unfamiliar houses. He's going to take you to a place with unfamiliar people. He's going to take you on a trial or a problem that you don't know where you are. You don't know how it is that you can get home. But church, all you have to remember is that you are with him. God will give you strength. God will give you strength, church, if you first remember to worship him. God will give you strength if you acknowledge your weakness. If you think that you can get through it on your own, God won't give you that strength. And lastly, God will give you strength as you wait on him. Let's pray.